I'd like to welcome you to our conversation. I'm here with a friend and an author I've been looking forward to having on for a long time. You will recognize the name Randy Alcorn because he has written a number of books dealing with the problem of evil and suffering. You've written some great books, Randy, on the question of pro-life and the abortion debate. But today we want to talk about a book recently by Bart Ehrman that came out called Heaven and Hell. And interestingly enough, even though I'm an apologist and I attract a lot of his writings in a number of areas, I was not aware of this book until I actually saw your review on your blog. By the way, for those watching, your blog is excellent. I repost and read your stuff regularly. It's insightful, it's consistent, it's well worth the read. So I want to encourage people to, uh, to follow that and track that and read it. It's excellent, excellent stuff, which is what many would expect. But I want to get into, get into some of the weeds. But first off, thanks for taking the time to, to come on and discuss the topics of heaven and hell, which I know are dear to your heart. My pleasure, Sean. It's great to be with you. I love the work that you do and um, looking forward to a great conversation. Well, I appreciate that. I want to encourage those who are new to the channel, make sure you hit the subscribe button because we have some other interviews coming up. We have a debate coming up next week. A discussion between uh, a Christian who embraces evolution, a leading spokesman in the intelligent design movement. Father's Day, I'm bringing on my dad to share some untold stories of the life of an apologist, which will be really exciting. So make sure you hit the subscribe button. Well, you've written a book on heaven, which, by the way, I love. And my wife said, when you talk to Randy, make sure you tell him how much she enjoyed it. She <laughs> actually used it in a Bible study uh, with a group of women and really, really thoroughly enjoyed it. But that tells me that this question of heaven, you've thought about it a lot and written on it as probably as much as anybody. And I saw you had over 2,000 reviews on Amazon, which tells me that book has had a really, really significant influence. And I hope our, our listeners will pick it up. But before we get to Bart Ehrman's book, recent book on, on heaven and hell, I'm curious, of all the things that you've written on, why did you write a book on heaven? Yeah, a lot of it, Sean, goes back to uh, when my mom was uh, dying of cancer in the early mm. 80s. And every day uh, I was at her bedside and I was reading to her uh, Bible verses, passages about heaven. Well, I zeroed in on Revelation 21 and 22 because it's such a long, sustained passage. But what hit me as never before, even though I'd been to Bible college, I'd been to seminary, had advanced degrees, all of that, despite all the training that I had had, we had never really dealt with Revelation 21 and 22. Because, you know, study the book of Revelation, it's the last thing in your Bible sequence, and you run out of time. And guess what? You don't get to the last two chapters. And then even in eschatology, uh, we were, we were, you know, into like arguments for and against the mid-trib trib rapture, sure. but we never had time to actually talk about the new heavens and the new earth where we will live as resurrected mm. beings with our Lord and Savior on a resurrected earth for all eternity. Now, I'd say that's a fairly important subject, you know, but we, we never got there. So as I was reading these passages to my mom, I was struck again and again with how concrete this was, you know, the the, the walls, the streets, mm -hmm. the river, the tree of life growing on both sides of the river is really a forest of life. Uh, the kings of the nations of the earth coming in and out of the city and bringing tribute to the king of kings who sits on the throne. And I walked away with a sense that, you know what, when I think mm -hmm. of heaven, I just pretty much think of the disembodied state. And sure, I believe sure. in the resurrection. I believe in the resurrection, but what's the resurrection going to look like? I mean, it doesn't make sense to have resurrected bodies floating around somewhere. Mm -hmm. And that's where the new earth comes in. So my, my belief all those years was I need to, you know, fast forward to the early 2000s. I want to talk about the resurrection, but in particular, the resurrected earth, the new earth where we will live forever. Mm -hmm. And so... At the time, there was shockingly little evangelical material on this subject. In fact, you could, you could find it in systematic theologies and in, in big theology books, but you could not find it, for the most part, on any kind of popular level 
uh, b- by popular, of course, I mean non-scholarly, sure. you know, type of level. And so I thought, I want to write a book that that people can actually read and learn about the new earth. So that was really my biggest motivation. If we're going to live there for all eternity, let's understand what we have to look forward to. And I really believe one of the reasons why people don't look forward to heaven and they kind of dread heaven. I mean, I'm talking even Bible-believing yeah. Christians have said things to me like, I, I can't even, I, I wish I were annihilated when I die. The idea of endless boring hmm. tedium for all eternity and go where did we even get that idea it's so hmm. unbiblical well that's beautiful i think your book on a popular level although it's a big book and nt wright's book the resurrection of the son of god really helps portray that resurrection is this future physical embodiment and that it's good so those two books really put that on my radar but let me ask you a question before we jump in because we're going to look at bart Ehrman's book and he obviously rejects heaven rejects hell, rejects the Christian faith. We know why he does, but I'm curious to hear from you, why do you believe in heaven? Well, I I believe it because uh, I believe the Bible and the Bible teaches it. I I believe in Jesus and Jesus uh, said a great deal about heaven and actually said more about hell than any person in all the Bible. Hmm. Uh, And uh, so it's it's a worldview issue. It's, It's what's your authority? And that's the thing, by the way, that really um, strikes me when I read, uh, Bart Ehrman is not the only skeptic I read, um, like you do. I read a lot of uh, skeptics. Um, I'm reading uh, four books uh, making arguments for Christian universalism right now. I don't believe in Christian universalism, okay. but it's just fascinating to Good. to study you know, and understand what other people do and how they quote scripture. Uh, and so selectively. And then I think, well, sometimes we as evangelicals, <laughs> you know, can can quote scripture pretty selectively. Uh, but, yep. but we just, you know, need to be aware of that. But it just strikes me so much with, with Bart Ehrman, for instance, how uh, confident he is in what he believes in. So when I appeal to an authority, I just did. And some people would sure. say, well, you're saying you believe in heaven and hell because the Bible says it or because you think Jesus says it, but can we even trust what Jesus said was, is really what we read in scripture. And, you know, Ehrman has a couple of books on that very subject. And I think we can trust it. And I do trust it. Mm. And in the end, I think, um, I sometimes have people say, well, gosh, that was kind of arrogant to think that you really know what's true about heaven and hell. Um, well, actually, I think it's almost the opposite of arrogance, because what it is, it's me submitting to a higher authority than myself. So I'm saying I will believe Jesus, I'll believe God's word, rather than believing my own inclinations. Because you know what? If I was given a vote on it, I would have cast a vote against hell. Uh, but I believe in hell. And I believe it's right, so so I, I don't want to say, like, now I would cast a vote against it, knowing that sure, God says sure. it's, it's so. But what I'm saying is God doesn't, you know, he didn't take a poll, you know. And it's not about what we believe, but we all appeal to an authority, and I think Bart Ehrman and many others hmm. look at themselves as that ultimate authority. That's a really helpful way to make a distinction because as I read his book, one of the things that really hit me is he approaches this with a certain methodology, which we all do. Thus, he comes to the conclusions that he comes to. And I, yeah. you, you might find this funny, but I, I did a TikTok video. My son's 16, so he's like, Dad, get on TikTok. And I was talking about why do I believe in hell? And I said, ultimately, if Jesus has risen from the grave and he was sinless and he taught on it, and we have his words recorded accurately, that's actually good enough for me because he sees with a clarity that we don't. Now, you read a ton of books. I noticed that you said you read about 150 books on heaven. You're reading books on universalism. I love that you read both sides. Why did you choose to write a review of the recent book by Bart Ehrman? Of all the books that you can review, why that one? Yeah, well, uh, I was contacted uh, by the Gospel Coalition, and uh, they said uh, this book was coming out. I think its release date was actually like the last day of April, so it's really recent. Uh, yeah, and, of course, yeah. in, in the COVID era, release dates, you know, kind of get missed <laughs> uh, because there's not 
bookstores that people are having big signings in and things like that. Um, so uh, they they asked me, um, Gospel Coalition, to write this review. And, um, you know, like you, I don't have time to do everything I'm asked to do. Uh, however, I, and I immediately knew I wanted to read the book, number one. Okay. I've read a number of other uh, of Bart's books. And um, I think I can call him Bart. We, we have actually been corresponding quite a bit Great. since he read my review <laughs> of his book. And it's, it's been a good, healthy uh, uh, dialogue, I think, um, where it will go. Who knows? But in any case, um, like to talk with people and certainly don't want to demonize him or anyone else. Uh, but I thought, you know, having read all these books and done all this study and I've written, I've got several of my books like um, If God is Good on the Problem of Evil and Suffering. Yeah. I have a chapter devoted to hell as part of God's answer to the problem of evil and suffering. Which to some people is like, well, what, what, what do you mean answer? Well, hey, if there's no hell and all that happens in terms of rewarding good and punishing evil happens in this life, then we're going to come up really short. Justice mm. will not be served. I believe in a just God who will exact justice for all eternity and that by the justice of the work of Jesus Christ on the cross, those of us who believe in Jesus will experience heaven by his grace. But also that there is a justice that relates to evil doing. And anybody who's uh, walked in the killing fields, uh, Pol Pot, been to the Holocaust museums, as many people have, uh, and if you think that all justice and injustice is worked out in this life. Mm. It's a huge disappointment. And there is eternal yeah. justice to be exacted in the life to come for the evils that have been done and not repented of. That's really interesting. I heard Bart this week in an interview with another atheist friend of mine, and he said that when he gave up belief in heaven is this reality that justice will not ultimately be meted out in an atheist universe. And I just think it's interesting that as human beings, we cry out for justice and we want yeah. it. That tells us something about the nature of the universe that we live in. Now, I want to come back to this conversation as much as you're comfortable sharing about your interaction with Bart. I think that's really cool that he reached out to you. But I'm curious, what were some positives from this book before we look at some differences and maybe some critiques? What did you enjoy or what did you agree with well, in his book? Well, first of all, I would say within his own worldview... Bart is uh, a largely consistent thinker, a very good thinker, and the way that I look at it, uh, and actually said uh, in, in my review, is that he is using his God-given gifts mm. very effectively. Mm. Now, I disagree with what he's doing. I believe sure. without intending to, he is misleading people. But at the same time, you got to admire um, his brilliance, um, uh, just simply the way he can, um, you know, it, he, he would be an incredible defense attorney. He uh, he'd be an incredible prosecuting attorney. Uh, etern <laughs> attorney. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Eternity. Get that in there. <laughs> but... Uh, but because he can do, he can, he could argue both sides. Now he doesn't. He takes his side. But then, sure. so do I. So do you. You yeah. take your side. I take, you know. So we're we're used to that. So there are things in the book. His treatment, as far as I know, his treatment of the Greek philosophers and sure. certain Babylonian things, and and um, uh, you know, just just different writers and thinkers. Homer. Um, I assume he's a historian. I assume what he's saying about them is accurate. Okay. Now, I haven't studied them as much as I've studied the biblical things, That's fair. which I think tends to not quite be as accurate okay. about. Okay. I, I think that's great. I don't think anyone can doubt his ability to think. Uh, he's a great influential teacher. He's smart. Uh, I've enjoyed watching some of his debates with friends like right. Michael Cohen and William Lane Craig. Uh, there's no doubt about that. And one other thing I do appreciate that he lays out his methodology in the book before he offers his critique. 
And I actually wish more Christians would do this because yes, when we put point. we put our cards on the table, then we can see where they lead. And one of the reasons right. that you and I disagree with him is because we would differ with his methodology from the beginning. But it's just a really helpful way to write on any subject. And I wish more people would do that. Now, you shared your personal journey. And it makes sense sharing the story of your mom and reading the end of Revelation. Bart seems to also talk about his personal journey a little bit. In the preface, now, of course, he grew up in Episcopal Church. I think it was Wheaton and Moody Bible College that he went to. And he says, quote, how disbelieving in hell, this is in the preface, can free people to appreciate, quote, the here and the now because they have nothing to fear. And then in the afterthought, he brings it full circle, kind of bookends it. And he describes an instinctual fear of torment after death. And I read this and I thought, I wonder if you've asked him this or any thoughts you had. This is kind of a part of his larger journey. If you grow up in a Christian home, at some point you have to deal with the reality or fear of death. I'm curious what you make of that because everybody has to make sense of questions in heaven and hell, don't they? Yeah, they really do. I, I, one of the things that struck me when I read that and also noticed that not exactly disparity, but somewhat of a paradox personally in, in his life with what he says early in the book and, and late in the book where he makes that admission about dreading or fearing uh, hell, even though he doesn't believe in it, but that instinctual thing. Mm. What struck me as, I don't think we should dismiss anything on the basis of whether it causes us to fear. Uh, I think it, it has to do with truth and untruth. Um, and, and I think if, if you say this is an untrue thing that is causing me to fear, then my fear doesn't have a basis, and I get why you'd say, and so it's not a healthy thing. But what if this is true, and that's why I'm afraid of it? Hmm. And I think we, we, um, we value so much uh, comfort that we the idea is if something makes me fearful, it, 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 it can't be a, a good thing. And so I won't even think about that thing. Or I'll reject belief in that thing. Uh, that really is not a good approach to life. And it, that it's not going to pay off in this life. And, and it's not going to pay off for the life to come. So uh, it just strikes me that let's not dismiss something because it, it, it makes us be afraid. Now, uh, if you're talking about the the monster under the bed, sure. by all means, help your kids come to understand there's really not a monster under the bed. <laughs> but if what they're fearing is uh, running out onto a freeway because they could get hit by a car, uh, that's a fear you really want to keep intact and, and, mm. and in a healthy way uh, develop it. I think this is a fair point because sometimes people would say Christians only believe because they want it to be true. But you would also say we shouldn't believe something just because we want it to be true or because it gives us hope or fear. Ultimately, we should look at whether it's true or not. I think that's good advice for both sides of this discussion. Yeah, and I think, too, that um, skeptics will sometimes, and and I I do feel this way sometimes when I read Bart's books, uh, but they, they will you know, have a sense that they, uh, they are very objective, um, that hmm. they, they, they don't have an ax to grind. Uh, Christians are not objective at all. We've always got an ax to grind because we, you know, and all of this. And so this idea that we have this self-confidence that what we believe is true, um, is not at all unique to us. <laughs> and so when I read the skeptics, I, and sometimes I just, I go, I hear them talking about the dogmatism of Christians and how dare they assert and affirm all these things that we can't possibly know. And then I read what they're saying and, and they are certain they're right. They are mm. absolutely certain they're right. now. To Bart's credit, sometimes he admits he's uncertain about certain things. He does, yeah, that's true. <laughs> he does. However, he he then will go right on and make incredibly uh, dogmatic statements that are every bit as, um, I don't know, st- strong-minded and certain as anything that any Christian 
uh, ever says. For instance, when he when he talks about uh, heaven in the Indians of going, well, I don't believe there's a heaven, but maybe there could be. And then he quotes Rob Bell, uh, and uh, and and basically is saying that universalism uh, would be almost the only possibility that could be true if there really is a God. Yeah. Because then he goes right on to say, basically, there cannot be a hell. Mm. There could not be a good God and be a hell. So that 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 is a subject mm. that's closed. He's absolutely certain on it. Um, and and it strikes me his degree of certainty that there is no hell is every bit as strong as my degree of certainty that there is a hell. Mm. But the difference is I'm appealing to an outside authority that I consider to be ultimately uh, infinitely superior to myself, mm. Jesus Christ, and, and the whole revelation of God's word. And what is he appealing to? his sense of certainty about his own ability to uh, to appraise what's right and, and what's wrong and what could be true and what could not be true. So I th- feel like he is his ultimate authority, and, and, and that's not unique to him. Sure. But we all appeal to an authority. Sometimes it's unspoken and sometimes it's spoken. Ours is spoken. We, we say, God, we believe in him, we believe in his word. But there's a lot of appeals to self-authority and that whole scholars believe and scholars teach. Well, some scholars do believe and teach exactly what Bart Ehrman is saying. Hmm. There are other scholars who think differently, but we do not hear from them that in is, his books. That is very, very true. <laughs> Fair enough. So let's ask this question. What What is the premise the basic argument of the book because I think it's very interesting that I didn't really realize this until the second time I went through it that his methodology in this book is so similar to his methodology in his other books so what's his basic claim that he's making here yeah it's uh, I mentioned in the review that it's it's kind of the deja vu all over again <laughs> that you that you get reading his books because he he tells the story uh, he's an insider to this Christian faith. He knows it upside down. He uh, was in Young Life. He, he went to Moody. He went to Wheaton. And then he finally went off and discovered truth at Princeton Seminary. Now, when Jonathan Edwards was president of Princeton Seminary, which was hundreds of years ago, um, there was probably a lot of truth going on there. And there are some things, I'm sure, that sure. are still true. At Princeton Seminary, but this is not like the repository of objective truth. Um, and so uh, I always get this. I believe the way you, if he's to the degree that Christians are in his audience, and they are to a degree, uh, many ex-evangelicals, for sure, many people raised in the Christian sure. faith. He has a following that is very Strong. You, you talk about reviews on Amazon. Read the reviews on his book. I've read on numbers of his books. Um, for instance, God's Problem, his book on the the the, the problem of evil yeah. and suffering, which he says is basically the thing that utterly disproves the existence of God, hmm. is this problem of evil and suffering. Well, I've written multiple books on that subject as well. But what? And and in fact, one of them, if God is good, has an entire chapter devoted to that book of Bart Ehrman's because I believe it's so significant. But but what you get again and again with whatever subject Bart is dealing about, it's uh, here's one more thing that Christians have got all wrong. I mean, okay. that's a that's kind of a bottom line uh, of his books. And if you look at his uh, book. Um, titles his actual uh i think i've got some of them right here yeah his subtitles tell the story his book misquoting jesus now the subtitle the story behind who changed the bible and why how jesus became god the exaltation of a jewish preacher from galilee and forged writing in the name of god why the bible's authors are not who we think they are well, to his credit, he makes pretty clear where he's going to be coming from, at least in the subtitle. But it's always, Christians have got it all wrong, but I've got this extra insight because I used to think what they still think. 
So he has basically marketed himself or been marketed by his publishers as sure. a reverse sure. C.S. Lewis. That's really what we've got going here. Okay. You, the, Lewis, who came from atheism, agnosticism. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. And then here's somebody who was on the inside of that, and he became enlightened the other direction. One of the things that I think is interesting is when he writes on the, the early history of Christianity, there's these ideas that there's this competition, say, for the Gospels, or competition about who Jesus is. But then when we read the same book, I noticed he said there was a competition in the view for the afterlife. So he kind of has this evolutionary story about how people didn't believe in the afterlife at all, came to believe in a little bit, believe in judgment, believe in the interim state. It's kind of this evolutionary story that develops over time is the methodology right. that he takes. So let's, right. jump, let's jump into some of the, some of the specifics. He says, uh, for example, uh, one thing we know for certain in none of them, referring to the passages of the Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament, can we find the traditional Christian view of the afterlife? Do you agree with that, or do you disagree with that? No, I, I, I disagree. Um, an example of that uh, that I jotted down, uh, Daniel 12.2, uh, multitudes who sleep in the dust of the earth will awake, some to everlasting life, others to shame and everlasting contempt. And by the way, this is uh, one of the strong arguments that the book of Daniel was not written in that era near the Babylonian captivity, 6th okay. century BC, whatever, is what? That Daniel uh, 7, 9, there's predictions of all kinds of things that are going to happen with different nations of the earth that hadn't happened yet. So obviously it was written later. It had to have been. Well, it had to have been, if there's no such thing as a miracle of God revealing truth to people before it actually happened. But then what would you argue for Isaiah? I mean, would you say that Isaiah was written after the life and death of Jesus? Well, nobody argues that, but it addresses these things that actually happen in, in the life of, of Jesus. And, and another thing that uh, happens when you, when you read Daniel, and another one is Job. Um, what's the passage in Job 19, I think, right? Yeah. Where, yeah, where, That's where right. what does he say about, did, did you have that in your notes? What he says about in Job 19? Um, what, what he Bart says re- about 19? Yeah, what Bart says, he, he, he rejects it. He, oh, he I did, got, okay, go ahead. Yeah. Okay. I just found it. Um, uh, he says, um, so, so he says, uh, in a footnote, where he's just saying there's nothing in the Old Testament, for instance, about resurrection and afterlife and all of that. And he says, um, some readers may wonder why I am not contrasting this view of Job, and it's on Job 19, with the famous passage of Job, uh, oh, sorry, Job 19, for I know my Redeemer lives, and at the last he shall stand upon the earth. And after my skin has thus been destroyed, yet in my flesh I shall see God. So that's exactly what I was wondering, and I was glad to find it in the footnote. But I'm going, how can you make these statements and then uh, just just ignore some? So here's what uh, he, he cites a Jewish scholar who says, quote, This text, Job 19, um, has been garbled, and we cannot tell exactly what Job intended to say. And then that scholar adds, Job is almost certainly not talking about seeing God in the afterlife. So I went to 12 different major translations. Not all of them, the, as you know, not all the Hebrew and Greek scholars are, by any means, are, are conservative evangelicals sure. that are, are doing these translations. And I compared all 12 of them. And there is a clear consensus. Sure, a mm. few different words, but they're synonyms. The construct is slightly different. And they all, these teams of Hebrew scholars, believed that this is what Job was saying. Mm. So I go, well, why, why does this Jewish authority and why do you, Bart, quote him to basically um, eliminate a passage that contradicts what you are arguing for simply on the basis of, well, okay. I mean, if I always did that, my research would be very easy. Oh, well, that can't, can't count on that. So, 
So your point is the Old Testament does teach a kind of resurrection and a judgment in the afterlife. But right. you see it that in this book, Bart is telling this evolutionary story. And if you have right. an early account in the book of Job, that would be way out of line chronologically speaking. Right. And so he dismisses this passage by citing an obscure scholar rather right. than the majority opinion that this actually is pointing to the afterlife. Uh, fair enough. It seems like some of your criticism is that there's some picking and choosing in the book to tell this evolutionary story. And, and that's fair. One of the things that I see, though, is there does seem to be a development in the Old Testament and a clarity about the nature of the afterlife and resurrection. So you cited Daniel 12, too. And Bart, of course, would date this into the time of, like, I believe it's almost into the 2nd century B.C., not around the 6th century sure. B.C., and say this is the one place that it shows up. Now, in one sense, I differ because I think we can go back to Job, like you said. But right. even if he's right, it doesn't mean that this evolved over time and people invented it along the way. Because at the heart of this book is he saying that ideas of heaven and hell were invented by people. So I'm curious if you would see this similar to what I do. I look back at the Old Testament and I do see a development in the doctrinal teaching of the afterlife and certain sure, progressive clarity. Revelation. Yeah, yeah, that's progressive revelation. We believe in that. that. That's exactly the point. So when it comes to the Trinity, the Trinity is not taught clearly in the Old Testament. Although I think there's hints like in Isaiah 6, when it talks about the singularity and the plurality of God, there's hints in Genesis. It's really not till the coming of Jesus that we see this with clarity. So even if we don't have this clarity on heaven and hell until the time of Jesus, Paul, etc., it seems right. to me that it doesn't follow that it was totally invented in the way that he interprets it. Do you agree with that or do you see it differently? Oh yeah, I, I fully agree with that, John. And I, I think one of the important things is that progressive revelation actually makes great sense if you believe what the Bible says, that Jesus, the God-man, actually comes down from heaven. Hmm. Now, wouldn't you expect, this is not just, you know, the prophet that's coming that's like Moses, though he is that. This is not just the greater David and the greater Elijah and the greater everybody. This is the one who knows. I mean, he is part of the triune God. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. And then he comes down and tabernacles among us and lives among us. And wouldn't there should be no surprise whatsoever that he, in, in much more full detail, lays out what God says, and then his apostles who he taught and whose words were inspired, God breathed, uh, that the words that we have written in Scripture, that they too give further development. So to say that, okay, well, Jesus takes this way further than the Old Testament does, and you go, well, who argues with that? I mean, uh, uh, why is that a problem? That's not a problem at all. Hmm. Um, in fact, God just has a, the way that he works with humanity has been, he just doesn't dump the whole load of truth at once. He doesn't. And so, yes, on the one hand, very significant that Job, likely uh, oldest book in the Bible written, or at least the events of Job, uh, began and ended before the book of Genesis, the first, you know, book of, of the Bible. And yep. so this is as old as you can get. You know, in in terms uh, in terms of you know biblically written documents, so that's a strong argument re related to Job nineteen. But as you say, even if that wasn't true, uh, progressive revelation is something that I mean that's a basic thing that everybody that goes to Bible college and theology learns about or should learn about. And so there, there's there's no surprise in this. And I think this is one of the things that you get sometimes for Christians who read things where they have not read a lot of Bible and a lot of theology and a lot of what evangelicals really believe and teach, mm. and maybe they haven't heard it, unfortunately, in their churches, they hear somebody like Bart Ehrman say this, and then all of a sudden they go, oh, he's right. Well, I would say, I don't know, 80% of the things he says in the book are probably right. I mean, it's just the conclusions he draws after he makes mm. this statement and certain sentences that 
turn this a different way. And as, as we know, the nature of heresy is that it can be mostly right in order to be credible and it contains a lot of right things, but it comes to wrong conclusions. Very, very interesting. I see some questions coming in here. Uh, one's from Leslie, who is a student of mine at Biola in our apologetics program. Great to see you, Leslie. Hold on to these questions. We're not ignoring them. We're going to come back. But I want to come in particular to some of what uh, Bart talks about in terms of what Jesus and Paul view about uh, heaven and hell and Bart's assumptions on this. But I would say I think it's very important that some of our assumptions come out and the way Bart approaches this, which makes sense because he doesn't believe in God, is kind of with a naturalistic framework. There's an assumption there's no supernatural. There's an assumption the Bible's not true. And of course, he thinks he can back this up. Now that we've seen this theology develop over time, it must have been invented. Now that is an assumption that approaches how he looks at this issue in the book. And that's where you and I would differ strongly. And really, if Jesus rose from the grave, this changes everything about how we look at the Old Testament, how we interpret Isaiah 26, Ezekiel 37, the Valley of Dry Bones, Daniel 12. That changes everything about the Old Testament. But let's jump to the person of, of Jesus. Now, one of your criticisms you mentioned earlier is that he felt he was a little selective with passages. And he says that Jesus never teaches that, number one, there's rewards and punishments immediately after death. And this kind of physical resurrection to punishment, hell, and to eternal life, heaven. But one of the passages that's inconvenient that you talk about in your book, Heaven, is Luke 16 with Lazarus. So I'm curious why that passage is important and what you made of Bart dismissing this uh, for reasons that he gives. Right. Well, I think reasons that are given are one thing. Uh, the real reasons sometimes are, and we do this as Christians sometimes, we, we don't want to believe a certain thing, and so we dismiss it without giving it much further thought because it's just not a credible idea to us. I think that's exactly what Bart is doing. The rich man in Lazarus teaches something highly specific, and that is that uh, immediately after death, you have Lazarus who goes to paradise, Abraham's bosom. He's with this conscious place of, mm -hmm. of pleasure uh, paradise, the word is, uh, means a garden, you know, it'd be like Eden-like, like the new earth will be, uh, but, but, but a preliminary place, not the ultimate heaven, but um, the present heaven. Okay. Well, then you have the rich man who dies and goes to what we would call the fires of hell, even though that too is not the ultimate lake of fire, but a, a temporary pre-hell and a pre-heaven uh, you could argue, uh, with, with Lazarus, but essentially what we call heaven and hell. Sure. Well, what some people say is, this is, it isn't so much Bart's line of argumentation, but, but some people will just say, well, that's just obviously just a story uh, that he made up. And this, there wasn't this real man uh, named Lazarus who died. Well, first of all, I think there's a strong argument that it, he is thinking of an actual man named Lazarus. And I'll tell you what, because who would make up that name and immediately confuse everybody about the other Lazarus who's risen from the dead in John 11? That's actually an internal reason why a writer or, or the person of Jesus would not, okay. oh, here's this hypothetical character. We'll call him anything, you know, but, but don't call him a name that's going to have to do with somebody else who died and went, how does this, you know, and it's just confusing. But I think mm. the, but the big part about it is that it's so specific and it's so tangible. And, uh, but even if it was just a parable and there was no real rich man and Lazarus in this story, what would be the point of Jesus telling a story that would lead people into false conclusions about consciousness and punishment immediately after death. The mm. whole point of the parable is gone if it doesn't mean that. What else mm. does it mean if it doesn't mm. mean that? And Jesus is not dumb. I mean, and, and uh, he, he just wouldn't, he just, he wouldn't do that. So that's really interesting because 
Bart tends to interpret all the teachings of Jesus and Paul that they taught annihilationism. Now, right. clearly, this is a debate within the church and goes back some time. I'm right. curious to you, how, how central would you put the question of annihilationism versus the way you described earlier in terms of kind of what some people say, for lack of a better term, eternal conscious torment? Is this an important but secondary issue? How would you frame that? Yeah, that that is a tough question, and I've thought about it. I, I think when John Stott came forward um, decades ago and said that he had come to the conclusion of annihilationism. That was after Clark Pinnock and many people who were uh, um, rejecting the essentials and fundamentals of the faith uh, had come to those conclusions and many others. Okay, you cannot say that of John Stott. John Stott was a rock in, 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 in almost every regard, in terms of his confidence in Scripture. And he was not denying the inspiration of Scripture. He, he, he changed his interpretation. So I would say a, 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 someone can certainly be a sincere follower of Jesus Christ and, and be an annihilationist and interpret hell as destruction, and the word destruction is used of it, but of a, of a complete and utter and final destruction. I still think you've got some very great difficulty with other passages that talk about eternal fires. Well, what's the point? Eternal fires for those who aren't there? Um, and the weeping and gnashing of teeth and all of the eternal types of references, I, I just, um, you know, certainly at the end of, uh, of Matthew 25, uh, with what Jesus is saying, and and the, the righteous will go into eternal life, and you know the the unrighteous into uh, eternal destruction. Well, that word eternal, and everybody always says this. I own on the the Greek. Well, that doesn't mean forever and ever. It just means for the ages, for the ages. Well. Whatever it means, as an adjective that denotes some period of time, the same adjective is used within a few words of each other for heaven and its duration as is used of hell and its duration. And I just think that's just hard to get around. So, no, I don't think it's a cardinal doctrine of the faith, okay. but I think, I think people should evaluate why they are coming to that conclusion, and is it really the biblical text that's leading them there? That, that's really helpful way to, to frame it for people. I think that's great. Now, I'm curious what, what bothered you or caught you off guard when Bart says that Jesus and Paul taught annihilationism. Is that you disagree with his teaching? Is it that you think he just showed one side as if it's a solid case without awareness of the other side? What caught you off guard in the book and gave you reservation when he just says it like this is slam dunk jesus clearly taught this without nuance right and i mean i just think that uh bart has a tendency that i think a lot of critics have which is to take difference and make that contradiction um hmm. you see this you know in the gospels you know with the angels of the tomb or were they men at the tomb and and the eyewitness accounts that include different things and are they different yes but to bart often difference means contradiction now i know sometimes he has what i would say are good arguments uh for certain problem passages that need to be taken into account what is the explanation for these differences in the gospel but those are a very small minority, whereas he makes sweeping things about all the contradictions, you know, in the gospel accounts. I think he does exactly the same thing with Paul and Jesus. So he'll quote, Jesus is saying something which Paul did not say. But then I read, but Paul did not say anything in contradiction to what Jesus said. Okay. You know, and that, that to me is, is like, okay, isn't it okay with progressive revelation, again, that if God was continuing to speak through God-breathed scriptures through these apostles, including Paul, that he would add insights to what Jesus said. It, it, it doesn't have to be restricted to. And I think this is the thing. God isn't doesn't just repeat himself all the time. 
And, and I think if he did, we'd, we either get tired of it or we'd use it as evidence that somebody sat down with a master plan, see how this fits perfectly with this, and it's even worded exactly the same way. And I think that that's evidence of collusion, uh, and, and, and that's not what we have. We, okay. we have true revelation. Well, one distinction we can make is the focus of Paul writing to churches, focusing on doctrine in particular cities, and Jesus being an itinerant preacher. So right. naturally, they're going to approach issues differently. Now, one, one of the things that Bart says is that Jesus and Paul, although they taught annihilationism, had very different views of the afterlife. Do you think it's just different and Paul added? Uh, do you think he clarifies? Tell me how you see the difference in what they well, taught I about mean, heaven. They both, yeah, they both talked about the resurrection. Jesus talked about it. John 5, resurrection to life, resurrection to damnation. Uh, Paul devotes a whole chapter to the resurrection, 1 Corinthians 5, and alludes to it in other places. So do you think Paul is going to say some additional things to what Jesus said? Well, obviously. Mm -hmm. I mean, because he devoted this whole chapter to it. I don't see those as contradictory at all. They both believe in the resurrection. They both believe, contrary to what I think Bart says at one point, uh, they believe in uh, conscious existence immediately after death. Paul okay. says to be abs absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. I desire to, 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 to depart and be with Christ, which is better by far. Oh, unconsciousness? Is unconsciousness really better by far? No, it's not, he's not talking about unconsciousness. He's talking about a conscious being in the presence uh, of God. Jesus Christ clearly taught that not just in the rich man and lazarus again let's say you can dismiss that which i think you can't dismiss it but let's say sure. you could he says to the thief on the cross today you shall be with me in paradise today you know you shall be immediately after we die we're both going to be in a place called paradise and by the way doesn't that fit perfectly with him telling the story of the rich man and lazarus i mean it does Interesting. Now, I, I want to get your take on a couple of pastors. There's huge debate about annihilationism within the Christian fold. I don't want to spend too too much time on it. But Bart goes to a couple of passages like uh, Matthew 7, 13 and 14, about the easy path that leads to destruction. He interprets that as annihilation. And then Matthew 25, about the sheep and the goats, that being destruction, not uh, some kind of eternal conscious separation. Is, in your mind, is this a plausible interpretation that is weighed out by other passages? Or do you think the idea of there being eternal separation from God is more reasonable with what Jesus taught? I, I, I wish that I could say that I believed the argument for annihilationism was every bit as strong or stronger than the argument from the text of Scripture for eternal punishment. I can't say that. I, I Again, I look in those passages. I look at the last verse of Matthew 25. You can say what you want to. Oh, well, destruction, that means, well, uh, of course destruction means destruction. But we have many examples in Scripture. Read 2 Peter 3, and you see uh, how the earth and uh, all that's in it is going to be destroyed. Well, there you go. There's never going to be an earth again. And in the very same passage, a few verses later, it says, Therefore, we are looking forward to the new heavens and the new earth. Okay. Well, you could say, well, when we die, are we destroyed? Sure. Our bodies, they go into the grave. I mean, a body that's been in the grave for 100 years, has that body been destroyed? Absolutely. Yet the Bible teaches resurrection. So, in other words, saying that destruction hmm. means uh, destruction doesn't change the fact that a destroyed thing can be remade and have hmm. a conscious life that endures in the case of those in hell and, and, uh, and, and beautifully exists in the case of those uh, th that are in heaven, rather. But in hell, it, that it continues, this life, this existence continues, but... Why is the body even raised? Why is the unbeliever's body even raised? Why don't if it's an if annihilation is true, what it just ends when they die, right? Mm. That's it. They'll never be resurrected. But Jesus says they will be resurrected. Mm. And so why are they brought back to life only to be annihilated yet again? I mean, it, 
or is it they're brought back into existence and now they face eternal punishment? Now, we do know, for instance, that Satan and uh, the false prophet and the beast are all thrown into uh, the lake of fire where it says they will be, I forget the exact language, but forever and ever, where they will burn or sure. be destroyed or whatever it is, forever and ever. And this is not Ionos, this is something else that's another, this just will go on, that, that this will be eternal. Well, um, maybe some people think the devil could be destroyed forever, but not people. But the beast and the false prophet, though, aren't those human beings that are in some way possessed by the evil one? So would that just be two human beings that will uh, experience eternal punishment? Um, again, if I had a vote... <laughs> I, I don't I don't want to believe it. I, I have dear friends who are unbelievers. I have family mm. members who are unbelievers. Mm. Do I want to believe that they would be punished forever? I, I do believe this. I think we underestimate not simply the holiness of God, but the depth of our own sin. Wow. I think we think of ourselves as far better than we are. And by the way, I we have a prison mm. ministry and I've worked with, as many people have, lots of prisoners, criminals, and I would say there's a characteristic of criminals that they almost never believe that either that they really did it or that if they admit that they did it, that it wasn't as bad as what other people thought it was that they did. There tends to be this overestimation of our own goodness. And I, I, I just think we don't take hell seriously because we think it's an overreaction, it's disproportionate, but we fail to realize not only the reality of our own sin, but the fact that our sins are ultimately against God, who is infinitely holy. Another thing I'll just throw in there, because this comes up a lot, is isn't infinite punishment disproportionate to finite sin? Well, the punishment is not infinite. It is eternal. That's not the same. Infinite means hmm. it's as great a punishment as it could possibly be. Where scripture makes very clear, Jesus said, those who are guilty of this will be beaten with lesser blows, and those who are guilty of that with greater ones. So we do have degrees of a, a, a punishment in hell, which suggests a level of appropriateness in keeping with the sin. I, in asking a question about annihilationism, I realized the comments that I opened up a can of worms, pun intended, by the way, but it's yeah. at least important to think about this sure. because it sure. shows up a lot in, in Heaven and Hell by Bart Ehrman. Um, let me read a passage for you on the note you were just sharing on from him and get your response. This is towards the end. And uh, Bart writes on page 294. He says, are we really to think that God is some kind of transcendent sadist intent on torturing people or at least allowing them to be tortured for all eternity? A divine being infinitely more vengeful than the worst monster who has ever existed. Now, you see hell differently than that. Even though you don't like it, wish you could get rid of it. How is he not right in his depiction of hell? I think whenever we, um, whenever we use ourselves in an analogy, because I think what he's saying is, by our definitions of goodness and our understanding of the rights that people have, we would say that any human being who has the capacity to prevent someone from that great suffering and doesn't do that, and certainly any human being who deliberately inflicts punishment on people, just horrible punishment on people, that we would say that person would be a monster. I think that's a fair conclusion. Hmm. Um we are not talking about finite creatures. We're talking about the infinite God. Now, a lot of people say, oh, yeah, but all you're doing then is you're making a case for God has the right to be a monster. No, I don't believe God is a monster at all. I don't believe he's a monster in any sense of the term. I do believe that his standards of holiness and justice and even his standards of love are far beyond what we as human beings can identify with. However, okay. we are quick to embrace, we get love, we understand love. So fine, God's a loving God? Okay, well, 
If you're a loving person, you would never do that to someone. Our inclination toward holiness and justice and wrath are nothing like our inclinations toward love because love is often in our best interests. Hmm. And so, and grace is in our best interests. And so, it's easier for us to wrap around our minds around those than to wrap around our minds around these other attributes of God. I don't believe in any sense he's a moral monster. I do understand why people say that. I do believe they're wrong. And I do believe if you mm. see God as the one who went to the cross and took upon himself the punishment for our sins, and anytime we doubt God, are you a moral monster who doesn't even care and you don't even have love for people or whatever, I think he could, in eternity, Jesus could hold out his hands and, and ask the question, do these look like the hands of a God who does not care? Do these look like the hands of a God who doesn't love? I didn't have to do what I did. I did it because I love you. Hmm. That That's powerful stuff. I, I wonder if you'd be willing to share uh, as much as you're comfortable with and appropriate. You said that Bart reached out to you, which I think is really cool, and you've had a conversation. Uh, any insights from that that would be appropriate to share how that conversation went, I mean, things you've learned? I think that I don't think Bart would mind me saying the tone of them, I think, has been... Um, Mutually um, kind, uh, Good. gracious, whatever you would say. Um, you know, he, he sort of obviously, I'm, I'm in great disagreement with many of the things you said, as you are with me. That, and, and of course, that's a given for both of us. Um, uh, he, he did say uh, something, uh, in, I think, in, in his first email that I thought was pretty funny in its own way, where he says, um, I, I, I know. Uh, that you think of me as, um, what was the word? Um, oh, as the devil's spawn. <laughs> and there's nothing I can say that will talk you out of that. So then I responded to it. I said, actually, I don't think of you as the devil's spawn. Not that I really know what the devil's spawn would look like anyway. Sure. Other than some movies that have been out there. But, uh, but, um, but I said, however, I do believe that sincere people can believe things and teach others things that are not true hmm. and which are harmful for them to believe. And 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 yes, I do believe there is a Satan. As, as you know, I would believe. You sure. used to believe. And so, uh, yes, I do believe there is a Satan and all that. And so he wrote back and says, so, okay, so you're saying you don't believe I'm the devil's spawn, but that I'm the devil's henchman, uh, which I thought was just kind of a cute way of saying, to the degree that, and it's not that I don't think, take these things seriously, but I think we're both trying to be respectful, yet Good. both of us not, you know, backing down um, on what we believe. One of the comments he made, and this is a, what I think we're going to have some further dialogue um, between us, perhaps on his website, perhaps on some on his and some on mine. But I, uh, one of the things that 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 really uh, struck me was. He said, when you say in your article about how confident I am that I am right, and that's Bart saying he's confident that he's sure. right, and, and saying all these things, he says, that sure seems to me the, 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 the pot calling the kettle black. Okay. Because of, that's fair. And that's, that is a fair statement. However, I don't think it's as accurate a statement as at first glance it appears to be. And it gets back to the thing where I actually am bowing my knee to a higher intelligence and a greater authority that I believe in. Now, you can argue I'm wrong. That, that, that higher authority doesn't exist. He's not real. Okay, sure, fine, take that argument. But I am, and I think there is a necessary humility that is involved in that. Hmm. So the idea that Christians are always these prideful, arrogant people who are saying these hateful things like, like there's a hell and that God would actually send you to hell or something hmm. like that. I go, you know what? I think the most wonderful person who ever lived, a person who I believe in and trust him, that I believe is the God man, Jesus Christ, who redeemed me and forever radically changed my life, filled my heart with a love that I otherwise would not have known. I trust what he said more than I trust what 
uh, my inclination would be to believe on my own. And so I think, actually, that there can be a greater arrogance in someone who doesn't believe in God, but just says definitively, this is right, this is right, this is right, this is right, and no such God could exist mm. if hell is real. I mean, a loving God could not exist if it, and have a real hell. To me, whether it is annihilationism or eternal conscious punishment, which I lean towards, but like you, I don't think it's an essential Christian doctrine in, so way, in, in say, the way the Trinity or salvation by grace is or the right. deity of Christ. Either way, ultimately, I believe in heaven and hell because of the person of Jesus, because of what he taught about it. I think we have his words written down accurately because I think Jesus had the moral authority in his sinless life. I think he had the supernatural authority in doing miracles and his resurrection from the dead. So really, this whole question about heaven and hell in many ways goes back to who is this person, Jesus? Did he rise from the dead or not? And is he, like you said, authoritative to speak on these issues? I love hearing that you and Bart, two people that I've read, uh, gotten to know you, have never met Bart, but I've read a lot of his stuff and uh, interacted with it in different ways. I love to hear that even though you differ firmly, there's a willingness to push back on ideas but a kindness shared with one another. We need much, much more of that uh, today. Interesting question. Hey, let me just interject this one thing yeah. in our conversation that I thought was was very kind. Uh, my wife, uh, Nancy, who's going in for a major cancer surgery uh, tomorrow, um, stage four cancer. She's going to have four cancerous nodes uh, removed from her lungs. But I, I explained to Bart last time we were in communication, I might take me a little while to get back to you because we got to get some things in order before she has this surgery. And he said, you know, I can't pray for Nancy, but I want to send her my sincere well wishes. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and I thought that was, that was a kind thing to say. And that touched me. That was really, really generous. Randy, thanks for sharing that. I did not know that. Didn't realize that was coming up tomorrow. And uh, appreciate you coming on the show and talking about heaven and hell and your interaction with Bard, especially uh, with this. So I'm going to ask those who are in uh, the comment section. I know there's a number of believers who are commenting. Will you specifically commit to praying for Randy uh, even tonight by name and for your wife? I, did you just say Karen? Nancy. I, Nancy I'm Nancy. so sorry. It was it was Nancy going in uh, tomorrow for the doctors for her through this, for her body, and for her healing. Uh, if you're willing to do that, write in a comment, and uh, we would love to lift her up in, in prayer. Uh, Thank you. Randy, so grateful for your ministry, uh, what, what you're doing, what you're writing on. Love the book on heaven. There's been a few comments of people saying, hey, has Randy written a book on this? I didn't know anybody didn't know you'd written a book on heaven. <laughs> But I want to encourage people. Somebody said, is it worth uh, picking up Bart Ehrman's book? That was a question on the side. And I would just say it depends on what you want to read a book for, what you want to get from it, your level of maturity and understanding. I, One thing you could do is you could pick up uh, Randy's book and you could pick up Bart's book. And you could read them both side by side, compare and contrast and see which one you think is most reasonable and then come back to this interview and listen to some of the differences between them. I know you would encourage people to be that open-minded and to look at both of them, but just look at them uh, critically. So, uh, Randy, hang on before you go off. Uh, to the rest of you, I want to make sure if you've hung around with us in this interview, quite a few of you have, make sure you hit the subscription button because we have some interviews coming up. In fact, Sunday night, I'm bringing on a friend, Mike Austin, to talk about God and guns in America. I've never spoken on this publicly, but this is an issue we really need to think carefully about. He's written a wonderful new book on this. Have a debate coming up about whether Christians or not should embrace evolution. And uh, bring on Hugh Ross to talk about climate change. He has a book releasing, and this will be one of the first interviews that he's doing as a physicist and a scientist approaching climate change. How do we think about this? A uh, number of other interviews, but one I'm looking forward to most is my father's been around a long time being an apologist. And I asked him recently, I said, Dad, for Father's Day, would you come on with me and just share some stories going way back when there was no apologetics movement? Some of the stories that you've never shared with somebody else. And Randy and our, our viewers, I'll tell you, some of these stories, if I didn't know my dad and some of the people involved, I'm not sure I would believe them. 
My dad has lived a remarkable, remarkable life. So hit that subscribe button or join us. It's going to be a life of somebody who's been a radical and an evangelist following Jesus, laying everything on the line. Uh, by the way, those so, of you... Let me just uh, interject this. I, I know and love your dad and mm -hmm. supported the ministry for many years and had lunch with him often when he would come into town in Portland and see him at other booksellers conferences and all that. And just what a, a delightful person. And I love mm -hmm. the fact that you're... You love your dad, you're proud of your dad, and you have every reason to believe, to be. And I, I just think it's a beautiful thing. Well, thanks for sharing that. My dad is my hero, and I yeah. uh, look up to him on, on so many levels. So, friends, join us at Biola. Come study apologetics and learn this stuff formally. We actually have a certificate program. If you look down in some of the notes, a discount code to study formally with us or consider getting a master's. Two other things, check out Randy Alcorn's blog. Follow it, read it, share it. Good, insightful wisdom. And pick up a copy of his book, Heaven. Randy, don't go anywhere. To the rest of you, thanks so much for joining us. Have a wonderful, wonderful night. Thanks.